Hi everybody, my name is Ariadne Albright and I'm an artist with the South Dakota Arts Council. I hope that uh, fellow artists are watching this and I look forward to um, not only sharing about the arts and health field, which has become my passion for this last decade, um, but also a hands-on project that illustrates some of these ideas that are coming up. So let me share screen and we'll get started. Here we go. So um, I've worked, I've had the privilege of working with the Arts Council and these organizations over the years. And um, actually some of you fellow roster artists um, and here's some examples of the projects that have come about in um, healthcare and community settings. What's important to note is that we're talking about either um, projects with individuals at the bedside or one-to-one -one, um, or collaborations where a, a number of people contribute a small part to a larger work of art. And then there's also some of my colleagues that um, perform or create um, in an atmosphere where people can be a more passive audience. And that's another um, great way to bring the arts into these healing and community settings. Um, we're still working with the state of the field from 2009. Um, there's plans for a new one to be written with updated data by 2022. But even back in the day, over 50% of hospitals had some kind of arts programming. And um, of course it starts with the permanent art collection, but then there's performances and bedside. It's important when I speak that I talk about, uh, although I'm a painter, when we talk about the arts in healthcare and community settings, it's all of the, the art forms, including music, literature, dance, um, drama, etc. And then there's a very, very um, specific distinction between fine artists and using our art form to help um, people either express themselves and their creativity or enhance their experience compared to the creative art therapists, expressive art therapists who have a clinical component to their education and they're trained to use their art form to support measurable results. And um, although fine artists know that there are numerous benefits in, in the act and the practice of creating, um, in these environments, it's really up to the clinical team to assess that. It's interesting, I think, to see the variety of musicians, therapists, visual artists, dancers, drama therapists, etc., working in the field. I have had the privilege of being a founding board member of the National Organization for Arts and Health. There's a website. I really encourage you to be um, part of the team, to join and participate. Um, I. Uh, had the privilege of being the chairperson for the professionalization committee and my passion is about um, this this work bringing this work to artists and also to other um, organizations because it's a wonderful marriage and so um, our focus was to develop and endorse these three professional documents that um, the field seemed to be asking for a code of ethics, professional standards, and core curriculum um, as a, as a um, baseline of best practices and goals for artists, um, arts and health professionals, arts administrators working in the field. And after those documents um, are used throughout our country, the goal, ultimate goal, is for an outside testing um, resource to provide a national certification exam. And we do believe that that's um, 
well underway, our core curriculum should be completed by um, spring of 2021. And what that would mean is that um, we would have some initials after our names, probably an AIH-C. And um, it's, it's truly not to take the magic out of creativity and our art form. And instead, it demonstrates to our future employers um, that we understand and can navigate the, the culture with, um, with safety, efficiency, et cetera. So um, there's a need for uh, further education if you're going to um, bring your art form into this field. Uh, but once, once that's understood, um, the ability to serve your community is, is just um, so, so rewarding. And um, you can go to the NOAA website and get a free download of the Code of Ethics and Standards for Arts and Health Professionals. And I would encourage you to do that as well. The Code of Ethics, or excuse me, the core curriculum will be for sale once it's um, published, more like a, a textbook. Then that could be the foundation for creating new arts programs, um, for academic programs, or courses. Um, it's really going to hopefully have a, a lot of application in our country. This is a, a photograph uh, from years ago uh, of me facilitating an art project with a fairly large group. And what it reminds me to say is that um, with the right invitation strategies, there really is, um, there are many ways to engage people at the level of their interest and their abilities. And so much of that uh, I've learned from working side by side with my colleagues that have also been doing this for even in some cases, decades more than I have. So it's, it's a very generous field. Um, the significance at the medical facility that I work at is um, that I was brought in as one of the approaches to um, reduce the use of antipsychotic medication, um, staff education, needs and pain assessment, and then this um, uh, arts programs to enhance quality of life. And, and it's been an extraordinary journal, a journey working with the clinical team Gail Batsky is the director of nursing, and she was the first to um, identify this shift in behavior and mood and just from more enhanced uh, art making opportunities. Uh, it's also important to say that with those collaborative and individual projects that I was talking about, I've had to go beyond um, my own painting and learn uh, rudimentary ways to bring in music and literature, um, et cetera. So here are some of the things that we've been involved in. And these fancy charts talk about the reduction of uh, this team and, and the application of um, these different strategies to reduce the use of antipsychotic medication among residents. And um, it's been very successful and rewarding to be a part of that team. Years ago, too, um, as a result of the arts programming that we did at Sanford, um, I started a course at the University of South Dakota, uh, an arts and health survey course that's now become a certificate program for undergraduate and graduate. It's a small um, niche certificate uh, within the fine arts department. And which includes three classes and an internship. And uh, I ex encourage you to explore that. We've got um, outside teachers now that bring uh, the perspective of other institutions. And, um, and uh, we couldn't be more proud of some of the students that have gone through this certificate program and what they're doing now with their, their work. Um, I just finished writing my first book. It took me five years, and it's um, it's a it's a milestone in that 
it is finished. It's about my experience as an artist in healthcare and includes um, interviews with my colleagues from the Arts Council, as well as uh, definitions of professionals, project development, in invitation strategies, and a, and a research, um, a case study research project that was done on our program. So that's currently available on Amazon. And um, I'm not sure when you'll be seeing this video, but in October of 2020, a companion piece um, called Creative Care Projects will be available for sale. And those are the top 50 projects that we've um, used over the years in those different art forms, um, suggested materials list. And then there's a section where I just kind of go off and, and ramble about um, my preferences with different art materials, which may be of interest. So you're welcome to contact me with any questions or uh, comments. Here's my email and two websites, one for arts and health work and the other for my um, personal paintings. I appreciate you staying with me this long. So let's go to this uh, hands-on project. I use um, it as an icebreaker and an assessment tool um, because we could be working with uh, adults with disabilities, we could be working in um, uh, jail facilities, uh, hospitals, there's really just an infinite amount of applications of our art form into these community and health settings. So um, you can get a, a print of this impossible shape, which is what the project is based on. And what I like to do as this icebreaker is invite my students or participants to turn the page over and then with a pencil, a graphite pencil, we start gripping it softly and drawing these continuous lines in all different directions, holding it up to make sure that we have it covered. And what that does is it, it gives me a sense of their comfort level with the tools, their willingness or ability to follow directions. Of course, you can see someone's um, energy or level of interest. And also, uh, you know, I wanna start with something that we can all win at and scribbling on the back page kind of takes away some of that um, pent up excitement about, oh, oh, we're gonna make art. And there always is some of that pent up excitement. So once that's covered, you might take a straight edge. I've got a file folder here. And I'm going to ask everybody to follow along and outline these shapes. And so we've been outlining this quote impossible shape with pencil and holding it down either by tape or with your hand and just encourage everybody to keep lifting up the um, page to make sure that they have all of the lines drawn out because once it moves you wouldn't be able to um, go back and align it and what I find is the the ones most missed are these little corners here but this is going to be the guide that teaches us how to make this impossible quote shape which is really just an optical illusion um, if you wanted to go back at this point, the graphite is, is looking pretty nice. I can see that some of the edges could be straightened out a little bit. I'm doing this just on plain uh, watercolor paper because I feel like that would be more available to students. Um, when I've done residencies in the past, I've done it on square canvases. And you can see that um, the first technique, uh, and again, this is a way to sort of introduce people slowly into a more complex painting. Um, the, the first technique is wet into wet painting. 
Um, we did the graphite transfer and talk about color theory. It usually melts people's brains a little bit when I ask them to do two secondary colors. And um, you would always have a color chart around. I like to keep this um, tin for folks because it demonstrates the primaries, yellow, red, and blue and the secondaries, orange, green, and purple, or violet, what happens when you mix the primaries. And then we go through this discussion about what are the two, um, two complementary colors that, uh, that they could choose from. And then inevitably we, we wrestle down to, okay, one primary and one secondary. But again, it engages them in the, the color theory and selection they, they have a certain amount of ownership into um, uh, why they've chosen what they have. Don't be surprised if it's based on uh, um, a sports team. But in this case, you know, there's always someone that says, uh, can I use pink? And then we, we get to have a discussion about um, values of colors. Um, and pink is, is a lighter value of, of the hue red. So uh, all, all, all of it can work in kind of a ca casual, less formal conversation. So in this case, um, red and green uh, is a, green is a secondary, red is a primary, and the purple and um, green are two secondaries. So that's an example of both. And now, um, I'm going to stop sharing it. Now, the idea is that we're going to paint the background first, wet into wet, and then um, the final part of this project is the paying very close attention once we learn how to make um, tints of our color to notice where the light and where the deepest is. And it's just a matter of um, slowing down and doing things in sequential order. I love the idea of something looking very, very complicated. And in fact, um, it's pretty easy to do. And I also want to hint that when working with um, different types of people, the, the wet into wet is um, very freeing and expressive and the gradation gives a lot of certainty and especially those that love the math and, um, and uh, precision, they also benefit from this style. So it's a little bit of both. I'm gonna pause now and um, get some paint mixed up, show you a little bit of technique and then the final piece. So I've got a little palette, an old um, plastic plate that I wipe down in between use, um, serving as a place for my paint. Another thing I do, um, just as a matter of principle, is I, I like to work with primary colors and white um, and black as a rule so that people have the experience of mixing their own colors. There's so many wonderful tubes of paint and variations out there. Um, I guess my sense is that once you learn that you can make almost every color from the, the primaries, then um, when people work on their own, they can bring in um, additional accents and, and all the colors that they want, but at least the foundation is there. So I've got the, um, red and yellow. I'm going to do orange in the background and then a blue and yellow for green in the um, main impossible shape and then white to keep it moving. So wet into wet is just um, grabbing a little bit of the color onto a blank area and that way we can see how strong the pigment strength is and what we need 
to get the color that we want. Of course, the yellow would be one of the weakest against the red. And because we were working on watercolor paper, um, we see a lot of wonderful transparency. If we needed to cover up something or make it a little bit more dense, we might add a little water and uh, white to increase the opacity. I'll do that here. When I say wet into wet, I'm making short little brush strokes, adding a little bit of water and moving my brush in a lot of different directions, mainly to cover that space and, and encouraging people not to overthink it. It's a nice sort of flame effect. And I'll pause the um, I'll pause the recording while I finish, but just remember to do the inside as well and don't fret if you go over the edges. I hope this is useful. Um, if not the specific project, maybe the process is something that you'll use in your own work or your work with others. Yeah, the wet end to wet um, worked pretty nicely. One thing to remember is that, um, what was I thinking while I was painting? Hmm. <laughs> oh, it's just that um, the wet into wet means that you're, you're not mixing an, an entire color on the palette, but instead you're letting it blend on the surface and using your brush as a tool where you load it up and you spread it out, um, you're using it from all different directions. And as, as you're coming into some of these edges, you'd use it on the side. Um, I, I've never been one about using real specific brushes for specific tools, but instead um, making them work for what I need. But in this case, I'm using uh, this, is it a bright? Not a flat because the hair is too um, the hair is too long, and I'll use it for the entire um, project. So next, I'm making a a green, and I know this blue is just going to be super strong. So I'm just going to grab a little bit with my brush and bring it over into a section that hasn't been um, used, so that I can mix it up and get start with a nice green. And the green is going to be my darkest version of itself. Uh, you can always fix things with acrylic paint. And that's why I, I love it. Just something even as simple as a Liquitex set. There's a red, blue, yellow, and a white. And I use that for um, many, many, many projects. Okay, so you're going to need this as a source when you're painting this impossible shape. So have it uh, on hand and then uh, orient yourself towards your painting and the shape and keep it, mm, don't move it around so you can keep your orientation. So I'm looking at this um, first shape here, this one, and um, as it relates to this here, this space here. And I can see that it's darkest down at the bottom. And then by the corner, it's middle value. And then it gets to be its lightest uh, up here. So that's what I'm going to try and reproduce with painting. And the good news is you can always repaint it once it dries. So I'm going to go with this nice angle. And I see, eh, it's okay. It's an okay green. Might make it a little darker second time around. But I'm taking the green that's been loaded on my brush and through 
pressure and oops, brush strokes. I'm laying down the first coat and knowing that as I get to the corner, I'm gonna to have to start thinking about its lightness. So I'm grabbing a little white and now I know that this is gonna be some of my lightest green. So I'll go to the corner, it needs to be lightest. And some of that wet into wet technique that we learned with the background is going to be useful for this part, except we're not going in lots of crisscross directions, but instead we're just layering. I just grabbed a little bit of green as I'm starting to make it darker as we go to the corner. But I say that the wet into wet is applicable because we're mixing it on the surface. Then turning the corner. Now, as I look to this first coat and the wet into wet technique, what I'm gonna do is, oh, where are we? <laughs> I'm gonna take a look at it and I'm gonna squint at it and see if it uh, the transition is smooth or if it's abrupt. To me, it goes light a little too fast right here. So I might lighten this area and add a little bit, another uh, pass with my brush over here to make that transition a little smoother. I'm gonna turn off the recording for a minute and just plow through to the end. Just notice that it alternates between light and dark, light and dark. And if you follow this pattern, you're gonna have yourself your impossible shape. Okay, see you in a minute. All right, <laughs> I can tell I'm starting to really fuss with it. So as much as I said, um, you use this as a guide, I, once I did this project again, I realized, no, it's really important. Keep the guide the same, but you've got to work it from a lot of different angles. Also, another excellent part about uh, making your own colors is that you need to, mm, remix them again and again. So it gets you even that much more comfortable with um, uh, not only mixing the colors, but then working with the value. And the last thing I'll say about the process is, yeah, there's a, there's a fair amount of um, tweaking by adding a little bit of water and blotting it on a rag and then sort of babying these lines until they smooth out. And every artist gets to a point where they uh, either, um, you know, continue to develop it or they 
fuss with it until it's overworked. For me, I'm going to stop because um, it's in a pretty good shape. And what's going to be more interesting is if you do the project and you post it on our um, Facebook page, then I can see what you came up with. But you got the gist. You can see some areas I'd smooth out, some other areas that I might play with. But I like this project and I hope you do too. Take care.